Entity framework with code first migration is amazing, right? But what if you already have a database, which is pretty common, I guess, maybe even more common than using the code first approach. So you have a database and now you want to use entity framework with the database you already have, and then maybe move on with the code first approach. So it is called the DB first or the database first approach. How would you do that? Well, you will learn this in this video here, right after you hit the like button. So as you can see here, we've got Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio open. I have an example database here, not Blazing Blog, not Time Tracker. These are from the .NET Web Academy, link in the video description below. But here now, this one is important, the video game characters DB. Teeny tiny database, but we even got a relationship. We have characters, as you can see here, video game characters, and then games because these characters, well, maybe they are a protagonist or a supporting character in a certain video game. So this is our database, all right? And then here in Visual Studio, what I got so far is just a .NET Web API. We have no controller. I removed the example weather controller, weather forecast controller, just the program CS in essence, and an app settings JSON file. Now, regarding the DB first approach, we need tools for that. And to install them, I suggest you right click the project file and then manage the NuGet packages and here now, first one would be Entity Framework, right? So please enter this, look for it, and download and install this thing if Visual Studio lets you. Next one, then very important, Tools, because Tools is giving you the following, Entity Framework Core Tools for the NuGet Package Manager Console in Visual Studio. And on the bottom right, you see here, these are all the tools you got. And we actually only need this one, Scaffold DB Context, to, well, scaffold our database context that we will use with Entity Framework. Later, if we then use the code first approach or code first migration, then we need stuff like add migration, for instance, uh, update the database and so on. All right, so this would be that. So please install this thing as well. And the last one then is the provider for your specific database. I am using SQL Server or SQL Server Express, the free edition. So what I can use then is, well, Microsoft Entity Framework Core. And then hopefully if Visual Studio didn't create Yep, this one here, Microsoft SQL Server Database Provider for Entity Framework Core. So this one for me it is, and again, in your case, this might be different, of course. Every day I get questions like, how do I start with .NET or how can I use Blazor to build modern web applications? I kept seeing the same problem. Developers like you are hungry for clear and practical guidance without getting overwhelmed. And that's why I created the .NET Web Academy. It's not just another course platform, it is a roadmap designed to take you from beginner to confident developer. I've packed over a decade of real world experience into step-by-step -step courses, hands-on projects, and a supportive community to keep you moving forward. Here, you will build real world projects to master.net and Blazor. You will learn industry standards and best practices and get help when you're stuck. So you're never learning alone. It's everything I wish I had when I started because learning alone can feel overwhelming. But with the right guidance, you'll level up faster than you thought possible. So make this year count. Start building the future you want one app at a time. And right now, to kick off the new year and make the Academy more approachable, I'm offering an exclusive discount on all courses and membership plans. A deal I've never offered before, but it's only available for a limited time. So this is the perfect moment to invest in yourself and your skills. I'm Patrick, and I can't wait to see you inside the .NET Web Academy. Right, so when we got these installed, the very next step, in my opinion, is adding the connection string here. You can also add the connection string to your database inside the scaffold DB context command, but later then you have to register the DB context anyways, and there you need the connection string again, so maybe it makes sense to enter it here. So let's do that really quick. We have the typical connection strings group here, and then you name it, in my case, let's just call it default connection, the very defaulty name. And then I have to look this up or better yet, I just copy and paste it. So here now, but let me explain it. Of course, first thing server, right? This one in my case, again, is localhost SQL Express. After that, the database name, in my case, video game characters database, then we got the trusted connection set to true, and then trust server certificate also true. And when we got this thing, we can actually start 
with the commands. And let me pull up the documentation here first. You see here I uh, was looking for scaffold. But here now you can see that we got a bunch of parameters. The connection, string, the provider, output directory, and so on. And they even provide uh, examples here. And as you can see, this is what I was talking about. We got the connection string here as well. But also you can use the name syntax here. And this is what I want to use. Because again, later then when we use code first, the code first approach, then we need the connection string anyways. So let's try that. And even if you don't want to change your model, so not really the code first approach, but if you want to build a web API, a controller, or use the minimal API, and you want to access your context, you need the connection string anyways. So long story short, let's just try that one. And this time I will not copy it, but I will try it here. And uh, yeah, you saw I tried it before and it didn't work. So let's see if it will work now. So scaffold dash DB context it is, and then name connection string, and then the default connection in my case. So we call the connection strings group. See that I was looking at this twice. So connection strings, and then the default connection, actually, Jesus, it is late. Sorry about that. All right. And so now here, the provider name, and this is usually just the uh, package name, the NuGet package name. So Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server. Let's try that and see if this works. It did. Amazing. <laughs> so I was not expecting that, honestly, but it did. And this is great. And what you see here now are the created files. First thing already, Entity Framework is creating partial classes. And maybe you're wondering, Jesus, why partial classes? I hate partial classes. Well, there is a reason. Usually when you use code generators, then they may be or may use partial classes because this enables you to create another partial class with your code where you want to change something maybe or add something rather. And then if you... And this particular case, rescaffold the, the 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 original files. Your code is not gone, right? It's still there, but this class here, for instance, will be overridden. As you can see here, if you know any framework already, you know what the DB context is. But I will also create an endpoint in a controller, so maybe it makes more sense, even if you are a beginner to Entity Framework. But apart from that, I've got other videos about Entity Framework, so please check out the info cards or just subscribe to my channel. This would be awesome. Thank you so much. Anyways, so here now we have the DB context default stuff actually we have the constructor, we have the constructor with the options and the base constructor then because we are inheriting from the DB context coming from Entity Framework Core. And then we have DB sets. This is already the stuff from our database. These are the tables in essence. And as you can see, Entity Framework is naming these properties, these database sets, same way as our tables. So characters and games and uses now the new generated models, character and game. We have the on configuring here for the connection string. So there it's also already set. And then here on model creating using the Fluent API for yeah foreign keys, primary key as well. Yeah, for the constraint here. All right. Okay. I think this should work. And we got other files, the character and the game. What I already see, what I don't like is that all files have been put into the root folder, right? So here's now our character model, again, also a partial class, but we see we got the ID, the name role, and the uh, game ID and the game, and pretty much the same thing for the actual game here. So ID name release here, and then the connection or list of characters. All right, this is nice. But I, again, don't like that these have been generated at root. So let's add some parameters. What we can do now is we can just run this again, but add now, for instance, output directory. And this is now for the entities or the models. So maybe we can just add the folder models here. Then what we can also do is the uh, DB context, I think the right parameter. Let me look this up again. So here, connection output directory, context directory, sorry, context directory. See that this is why we have documentation guys context directory is now data let's say what else we got namespace the actual context name but i think the name is already great we can define if you want to use specific schemas or tables we can use data annotations instead of fluent api i tried it did not really work and the framework added attributes but uh use the Fluent API anyways. And then we got force, which is now, well, no, it's not not necessary in our case because we changed the folder or the directories. So let's just try that again. Because otherwise, if we would uh, use the root folder again, then we would have to specify this parameter. So as you can see now, we have our models folder. 
right? And also the data folder here. And this is great because now it's pretty much the same way I would do it when I would build the uh, entry firmware code first approach. But this means as well that we can remove these files here, character, and then this thing as well. And this now should work. And I like that it does. What we have to do now is register the DB context. So in the program says right here, we can add builder services at DB context and then just our video game characters db context like that and let's just see if this already works now regarding the controller let's add one to just try receiving all the games all right so we add a new controller an api controller an empty one of course you could also use a minimal api right in the program cs or create another file and use it then there and here now i want to create a characters controller with only one method a get method and i will not go into the details here what are all these attributes i've got another video for that again check out the info card this is a great video i guess one hour long course where we built a complete web api with entity framework and all crud operations all right and now here let's uh first First, actually inject the uh, DB context using a primary constructor and this would look like that so video game characters DB context that's correct context so we got the context already and now a public async task we're returning an action result with let's say a list of characters all right so that we need another reference and here we say get characters all right and here now this is an HTTP get method or we're using the HTTP request method and result is pretty simple. We just say await context. Now we can access our characters. This is nice, right? And say to list async, for instance, but I also want to see the games. So when I do it like that now, I would not see the games, but let's do this one step after another. So a little web API lecture here as well. And uh, let's just run this thing. All right, and now we got this little file here. Usually I wouldn't do that. I would use Scala, for instance. But here now what we can do is we can just change the route and try to run this thing and we get our games. Isn't that great? So this already works. Now let me explain one thing. I ask the question here, maybe this works, maybe it doesn't. Usually when I build this using the code first approach, I have to set the option here that the specific provider SQL server is used with the connection string. But what Entity Framework did here with scaffolding, maybe you saw that already, is this thing on configuring, right? So you can override this method as well and set the connection string there and also the provider. So here it says for our DB context, we provide some options. And in these options, we say use the SQL server. This is also why we need the NuGet package for SQL server as a provider and then use this connection string. All right, so this works as you can see as well, but still we have to register the DB context. When I would leave this out like that and then restart the application and let's try to run this one more time. There yeah. There it is, unable to resolve the, the video game characters DB context, right? So you have to make sure that it is registered here and the reference, and then this should work. But maybe you saw this as well. We have two characters, but we do not have the games. So here now we do some entity framework magic in our controller. We add this little link function called include. And here now we add a little lambda expression for link info cards on the top right. <laughs> include for uh, C for character. I want to include the game. All right, let's try that. And let's see if this just works or we have to change something else. So uh, now again, let's send the request and it says another error. And what does it say? Serializer cycle detected. Yes, of course, because these are the entities, right? We have the character with everything, ID, name, role, game ID, the game. When I include the game, when we look at the actual game then we have id name release here oh yeah and a list of characters and every character then again has a game that you want to include and these then have the character and these the game you see the cycle right so what we can do in this particular case we could add the following attribute and that would be json ignore so that this is not serialized thing is at this place it doesn't make sense because i want to actually see the the game what i don't want to serialize is this thing here the characters all right so we see the game with the id the name and the released here, but then not the list of the characters of the game. This means we don't have a cycle anymore. The better way definitely in this case is using a data transfer object, a DTO. Again, 
check out the info card, so many info cards this time, because then you would build maybe one result object where you put all the information there that you actually want, right? You have uh, specific character information, maybe you don't want the ID, I don't know, and then also put the game information there and leave out the characters, for instance, right? So that's that. Let's just run this one more time. And then here we send another request and voila, now we have the character link in this case from Legend of Zelda. Isn't that nice? Geralt from Witcher, Joel from The Last of Us, Ellie as well, and so on. I just love that. So this is the database first approach, but what about code first now? I don't know how you work, how your team works, your company. Sometimes it might be the case that the database team says, hey, I make this change now to the database and I don't care about you guys who are developing. I'm the master of the database. So they just change something, then you just have to rescaffold. all right? So that's why we have partial classes. If you want to add a method here, for instance, anything, create another class, all right? So the code is not gone. But if they add something to the database, another column, then you would have to just rescaffold, and this hopefully is everything you have to do. But if you now say, I want to use the code first approach, then you can do the following. For instance, let's say in a game now, real quick example, we add one more thing. This is the developer, for instance, right? Developer, publisher, whatever. And this is an empty string maybe by default. What can you do now? Well, we can now say add migration, at developer, for instance. Now this means that Entity Framework will create a migration file. And as you can see here, we've got two methods, an up method and a down method. And this just means that in the up method here, this will be done when we apply the migration and the down method, well, we are rolling this back. It looks pretty interesting, right? Because it says create a table for the games table and create a table for the characters table and then removing it when we roll back this migration. So let's just see what this thing will do when we say update database. Hmm, this doesn't seem to work, right? It says there's already an object named games in the database and we got another error up here, create table games. Yeah, of course, that's absolutely correct. And now this makes sense here, right? It really wants to create a table or two tables, games and characters. But the thing is when you scaffold the, the models and the DB context and that stuff, and then you want to use code first. The thing is that our application isn't really synchronized with the current database. It sounds crazy, I know, because we actually scaffolded the database, right? But when you use the code first approach, what you get is, as you can see here, you get a video game characters DB context model snapshot. And then in the database itself, up here, you would also get some kind of EF uh, migration history table so that Entity Framework knows what's the current state of the database and what's the current state of the application. So we have to synchronize these states. How's that done? Well, first let's remove this migration here. So we just say remove migration. All right, with that, the file is gone. Then in our games class, let's remove this just for a minute. And now let's go back to the package manager console. And what we do is we write at migration initial scaffold data base, for instance, in essence, nothing changes here, right? But we just remove this stuff manually. So here now I don't want to create a table, all that stuff, just remove it so that the up method and also the down method is empty, save this and now call update database, run this, and nothing should change, right? But as you can see here, we have this E F migrations history table now. So when we go to the database again and refresh this thing, then now you see the EF migrations history. And as you can see here, we have a, well, a product version and migration ID database. All right. And now one more thing here now in the migrations folder, we have this file and then also this file here. This is the snapshot. And here you see we have the character with these properties. We have the game and so on. And now when we go back to the game and add the developer, now run at migration at developer we get new migration files. And this is what you want, right? The table stays the same, but we only want to add one column, the developer to the games. And in case of removing this migration, rolling it back, then this column would be dropped. So now we can update the database again. Right, go back to SQL Server Management Studio. And uh, let's just open the games again, close it edit and there you see this is now the developer and uh, let's just say Legend of Zelda is Nintendo. We run our requests 
there it is, send requests. And now we see, get the game with the developer. All right, so now the next step is to actually implement all the CRUD operations. And again, for that, I've got a one hour long course for you. Check out this video here to build the complete web API with Entity Framework. See you there, happy coding.